How are you doing? I am blessed and highly favored. Good expression. But that is wishful thinking. So today we'll clear the record. Based on God's word, which says you are truly blessed and you are truly favored by God if you do only two things. You want to know those two things? The two things the Bible says we should do in order to proclaim that I am blessed and I'm always highly favored by God is to honor God and serve people. Do what? Honor God and serve people. Do what? Honor God and serve people. I honor God every day by the things I do. I honor God every day by the things I say. I honor God every day by worshiping him. I honor God every day by obeying him. And I know that I cannot obey him in my own power. So he has said, don't worry. I'm the God who's working where? In me. Say, God is working in me. Giving me his desires to do what now? To obey him. Ah, you got it. Giving you the desires to, you see, because our own desires are very selfish. All of us. So he gives me his desires so I may obey him. And then because our strength is so limited, he gives me the power to please him. So every day from now on, you see in the past when you heard somebody say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly. And you thought that was good. But if you continue with the conversation, they will start telling you complaints and things that are happening in their life. You kind of ask yourself, is this a man who is blessed and highly favored? They contradict exactly what they just said by the way they live. So we know the trick. We know the secret. We know the game. The game of God from his word. If I want to be blessed, if I want to be highly favored, every day of my life, I do two things. What are the two things, church? Honor. honor God and serve people. Hallelujah. Could you write that down? If I want to be blessed and highly favored every day of my life, all I need to do is to honor God and to serve people. Hallelujah. Before we get to the four dynamic, exciting blessings I brought for you this morning, I'd like us to review what we've done in the past. Amen? We are teaching a series on the culture of God's family. What is God's family? God's family is composed of people who have made a personal decision to accept God's wonderful gift in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. You and I were born in a human family. In this human family, you and I had no choice. Amen? We just saw ourselves in this life. No, the kids that are born in Pastor Emmanuel or uh, uh, Minister uh, Edwin's family, they did not choose to be born in that family. Neither were you. You did not make that choice. You just saw yourself born in a family. But God says, I have good news for you. I have a better family. My family. And you don't have to do anything. What? No. You just have to accept my gift. Just with your will said, God, accept what Christ did on my behalf. And you belong to God's family. Please, let's not complicate this good news. The good news for everybody is come to Jesus and he will show you the way to the Father. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am life. No man can come to my Father except through because I came to die on this cross and took on my own body everything Thing that is terrible in this world. Everything. Abortion, homosexuality, gossips, killings, stealings, you name them. I came purposefully to take all of that and put it on me, on the cross. And in turn, I give you eternal life. In turn, I give you freedom. In turn, I give you joy. In turn, I want to make you 
blessed and highly favored. Yeah. Hey, my God. You are not blessed and highly favored from your human family. But in God's family, you are blessed and highly favored by God. Hallelujah. This is the good news that we have. Praise the name of Jesus. We have looked as we review quickly because we all forget this series. It started with how do I deal with God's culture? As we said, God's culture is different from human culture. Um, we said that God created me and you and every person on planet earth with one object to love you. Nothing surpasses God's desire, God's intent to love you. Nothing. Brethren, if you forget every other message which you, you have heard and you hear, get this message that God loves me. He created you and me in his image to love us. Parents, even human parents, when they give birth to children, they want nothing from the child. Amen? You can see our minister of, of, um, of praise and uh, our brother, um, Minister Edwin, they have their babies where? Can you watch? Where do they have their babies where? Oh, in their heart. Right there. That's where the heart is. Praise the name of Jesus. What are they asking from those children? I wish it today was Wednesday I was giving them the mic. But I guess they will say, we want nothing. We just want to love them. We just want to love them. So that when they grow up, then they will love them back. I was talking to uh, a couple the other day and um, the man, the, the couple said that the daughter is very excited. The granddaughter was very excited about the grandmom because when the granddaughter was growing up, he grew up with the grandmom. And even though the grandmama is so frail, she's getting married. Instead of going, getting married in the Caribbean, you know what she decided? I'll get married in Atlanta where my grandma is so that she can be at my wedding. I want to show her a bit of the love that she showed me when I was growing up. Same way. God loves you so much that the intensity of God's love would make me and you to love him back. Praise the Lord. So, the first thing we said was, you are God's primary object of love. His love. And we know that that love is not a fickle love. That love is unconditional. That love is sacrificial. And that love is eternal. Wow. Brethren, may God open my eyes. May God open my heart to truly understand the length of God's love. Which never ends. And it has a name. God has attached his name to that name. Jehovah Olam. The everlasting God. Amen. My love is so long. That in this life. And in the life to come. I will always love you. Always. God never changes position. No matter what you do. His love is consistent. Some people may take advantage of that. And say, because God's love is consistent, I cannot do my thing. Then you don't understand what God's love is. In fact, in the church, we pastors should not preach about sin. If people understood, listen to me, if what? People understood the, gift, the love of God. Amen? You will not force people to come and pray. They are motivated by God's love to come on. To come on. They are motivated by God's love not to sin or gossip or do these things. That we hammer on the pulpit. Don't do this and don't do this. It is because we have not understood the magnitude of God's love. Once I understand God's love, I will run towards God. I will want to please God. I will do everything to make God happy. Because I understand. Amen? The two children who are leading, if they started walking and mama and daddy said, come, what will they do? They will come. If they get hurt, what do they do? They come back to the one who loves them. That is the magnitude. That is a revelation I'm praying to God for me and for all of us. 
that will understand the length of God's love. Will understand the width of God's love. What is God's love? What's the width? God's love is everywhere present at the same time. And he gave himself a name of that. The Hebrew name is Jehovah Shammah. God who is present everywhere at the same time. Present. Go up to the moon. Thank you, Pastor. Go to the ocean. Go to the depth of, the, of life. Go anywhere you find him. Then he says, hey, when you commit sin, I'm Jehovah Salah in the Hebrew. Which means, I'm the God who has promised that anytime you run to me because you've sinned, I will forgive you. I will cleanse you. All of your past, your past will be taken care of. You will not have to bother because you've come to me with a sincere heart. I will erase it. The God who forgives. And anytime you think that you've fallen so low, you've fallen so low that you are desperate, that you think you're hopeless, everything is gone. God says, hey, I'm Jehovah El Elyon, whose hands are so long that they will undergirth you. So you don't have to fall into the pit of depression. So many people today are falling in the pit of depression. So many people today are they are destitute. They are hopeless. They don't know they are, they don't know where life is taking them. But my God says, my everlasting hands are where underneath to hold you. Please allow me to share this again with you guys. You know the king of the birds. What's his name? The eagle. The eagle, when he wants his children to start flying, he goes and throws them out of the nest. Hallelujah. And the children start fretting. <laughs> Before the children know, the long arms of the eagle, mama eagle goes underneath them and scoops them. Scoops them and brings them back to the nest. Say, when you are depressed, when I'm depressed, the everlasting hands of God undergirth me. When Satan wants to put me down, when people want to put me down, God's everlasting hands are there to undergirth me. That four-dimensional love of God is represented by the cross. How high? How deep? How wide? How long? Amen? The four cardinal points of the world. North, south, east, and west. That's how big God's love is. For you and for me, my prayer, God, is to take away this mentality of sin, 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 sin. Because that's where I came back from. from, from. That was my background. Every Sunday I went to church, I had sin, I had sin, and sin, and sin, and sin. And if you looked at most of us, we left the church depressed. We didn't live for the better. But when you tell people the good news of what God has for them, they change. You always run towards things that are good. Do you? Do you? When there's light, what do you do? You run towards that light. When there's something that's filled, you run towards it. It's because we have not gotten the understanding, the revelation of God's love for you and for me. He loves you perfectly. We don't even know what perfection means. But that's God's love for you. And it will make us do things we go out of our way. Amen? We we'll go out of our way. Say, I've understood this God who loves me. And I'll do everything for him. So, your main object, the main object that God created you and made into his own image is to love you. May God help me. And may God help us to understand that. Number two, God wants us to know that he's made you to belong to his family. Will you say amen? amen? Number three, God wants you to become not like any other person, not like a denomination or whoever, whoever the star is. God wants you to become only like his son, amen. Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate purpose why God created you. To love you, for you to belong to his family, and to become like his son. He doesn't want you to look like any other person. The 
these comparisons, oh, this big man here and that big man, forget it. He wants to become like his perfect son. Today, I bring you good news as we examine the fourth thing in the series. God called you to serve him and others. From today, say, I'm bivocational. Amen? Amen. You are bivocational. Bi means two. It means God wants me to serve him and serve others. Oh my God. I'm so excited. I don't know how to to jump and, and scream and dance. I don't know that God has opened my eyes to understand that I am called to be bivocational. To serve him and to serve others. Hallelujah. So we'll begin by reading what is not on the screen. It says in 1 Peter 2 4, Come to Christ, who is the living foundation of rock, the cornerstone upon which God builds. God builds only on the sure foundation. On Wednesday, we said that you cannot have stability in anything in this life. Can we prove it? Do you know people have been friends today and then tomorrow they are enemies? There's no stability. Do you know people who had jobs and lost those jobs? Do you know people who have been very healthy today, tomorrow they are sick in the hospital? Do you know people who went to the arm, who went, oh, thank God for my son, thank God. But I, when I watch television and I see those who come with half limbs, no eyes, nothing, they went to fight for this country. Before they left their families, they were healthy. They were whole. Some have come in a bag. What do you call those bags? Body bags. What do you call them again? Body bags. Body bags. Dead. Your husband goes with children and then they bring a bag. A dead a corpse back to you. I like the song that there's a man called Nico Baraga. What do you know about him? He says there's no condition is permanent in this world. But I can tell you one condition that is permanent is having God in your life. He brings the stabilizing force. Only God can fill that place to give you stability in this life. He will not only give you stability, he will give you security, he will give you blessings, he will give you favor, you name it. Everything is in God. So we cannot afford, we cannot afford, brethren, not to have God in our lives. So today we want to give you an opportunity. Can we do that, church? For those who are not in, we want to show you how. Amen? Those who are not where? In where? The family. God's family. We want to beg you. We want to go on our knees. Come to Jesus. Don't come to a denomination. Don't come to New Life Fellowship. Forget those nonsense. Come to Jesus. And so we want to pray with you now. If you want to have God in your life, if you want to have the one stabilizing force in your life, God in the person of Lord Jesus Christ in your life. If you have heard and you have understood, please pray this prayer with me so that you too become a member of the amazing family of God. Amen? Amen. Say this prayer with me aloud with joy. Holy Father, Father, I come to you just as I am. Please, Lord, forgive my sins. Come and take residence. Come and take precedence. Come and control my life. Come and be at the center of my life from this day forth. I've prayed and I've been told that you took away all of my curses, all of my sins, all of my trespasses, every sin that I've ever committed, I'm committing or will ever commit, you took them and bore them on your body on the cross. And now, I receive you. I receive your love. I receive everything about you. Take my life and make it thine. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer from your heart, You said, because God sees the heart, not the external. If you said that prayer from your heart, according to the authority that has been given to us 
in the word of God. You are a member of God's family. And you know what? Heaven is rejoicing because you made that decision. If we here are a little bit lukewarm, that's okay. But heaven is rejoicing. Can we rejoice with heaven? Can we rejoice with heaven? Hallelujah. So today we want to consider our bivocational calling. Serving God and serving others. Galatians 1.15 from the GNT. Again, I always like us to read. The word of God is so sweet. That's why I invite you to read the word with me. Hallelujah. And sometimes it keeps some of us awake. And it helps our mind from drifting. Thank you. Because as pastor read to us in that write-up, we are we have a proclivity. Proclivity means we have a tendency to go astray. So help me, are you? Wow, those of you out there, I wish you were here to help me together. Hallelujah. Galatians 1.15 Go. God in his grace chose me even before I was born and called me to do what? To serve him. He called me to do what? To serve him. Oh my God. From the very beginning, God chose you and me to serve him. Nothing more, nothing less. He knew you. And we'll see later on your shape, which was introduced many times in this church. He's given you a unique shape that has allowed only you to make a contribution to this world that no other person can in Jesus' name. The Bible says in Titus 2.14, again, it's not on your screen, Titus 2.14, God has purified for himself a people that are his very own. Are you God's very own? Yes, I am God's very own. Say, I'm God's very own. God's very own. And these people are eager to do what is good. You are created in God's image to be bivocational. And we said you are created to serve him and to do good to others. Oh my God. Let's have another passage which is on your screen. Ephesians 2.10 called to serve God and man. Ephesians 2.10 Let's read together. Go. We are God's workmanship for what? Created in Christ Jesus to do good work. Oh my God. Titus tells us, you have created to do good works. You are eager to do good works. The book in Ephesians says, your purpose in this life was to do good works. So if I do bad works, that's not my, my portion. Amen? My portion is to do good works. Which God did what? Prepared. Where? In advance for us to do. My God. See, before you came into the scene, before you came into your mother's womb, God had planned it all. That you are destined to do good works. And that decision comes all the way because I know God loves me. The foundation of it, uh, we have the end of this message, we have two more messages. And the last one will show you an umbrella and how all of this fits into that umbrella of love. If you understand, if I understand what love is, I'm telling you, you preach nothing else. Let people get a revelation. They will jump at it. If you see good food, you go towards that good food. Amen? Amen? Now, here are the four amazing blessings that we get. The first one, can we read it together? It creates massive amounts of joy in your life. <laughs> when I serve God by loving him, by obeying him, by keeping his, his word, by, by, by worshiping him, and most of you, please, adopt the habit of worshiping God in your bathroom when you are bathing. Amen? Don't just put the water. Just thank God for the water. Because there are many places where we don't have showers. Hallelujah. I went somewhere, I won't tell you the name of the place. You have to put water in a bucket and do this. Right? And maybe the water is not enough. 
because they ration the water. So you don't get much water. You don't even get a full bucket. Praise the Lord. But here you are. Ha! When you serve others, you get, and God, God and others, you get massive amounts of joy in your life. Can we prove that? Can we prove that? Where can we get that from? The Bible. Thank you, Mama. We have two verses to always support our thesis. So we don't make noise. We have to always two. Because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, what? The truth is established. Can you help me now read Philippians 2, 17 from God's word translation? Go. My life is being poured out as a part of the sacrifice and service I offer to God for your faith. Yet, I am filled with joy and I share that joy with all of you. <laughs> when I serve my God, I'm serving you. Many people don't understand this. That when they serve others, they're serving. Let's read Philippians 4, 4 to 5 from the TLB. You have massive amounts of joy. When you serve God and others. Let's read it with joy. Go. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. Let everyone see that you are unselfish and considerate in all you. Ha! What makes people not to understand that I'm full of joy? It's when I serve self. Myself and me. The way out of it is when I serve others, I become unselfish and I become considerate of others. So serving is others focused, not me focused. God focused, others focused. Isn't that simple enough? Praise the name of Jesus. So the first thing is that I'm filled with massive, massive amounts of joy as I serve God and others. Is that clear? Yes. Who wants to have massive joy? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Yes. Amen. We have no need today. Serve God. Serve others. Number two. Amen. Amen. When I use my life to serve and bless others, when I may bless to others, it improves my relationships. Hallelujah. Not only does it give me massive joy, it improves my relationships. Many of you can attest to this in this church because you are a wonderful group of people and you help others. Every time you do something to somebody, watch them. Very joyful. <clears throat> we had, when we were back home, two girls who were helping us raise up our kids. They were my wife's relatives. They were very opposite. When we used to give them allowance every month, amen, whenever I receive my salary, I'll give monies to my wife to give to each of them. One of them, when they received, I always wanted to watch. She'll be so excited. Wow, mommy, thank you. It brings so much massive joy to you. Amen. amen. And improves what? Your relationship. These girls worked very hard. Um, we were blessed because I used to teach at the university and my wife used to work. And many people leave from the church after service. The young people, they will come. So every Sunday we prepared so much food. <laughs> and they will all come to Elder Ikane's house. Hallelujah. And Mama Ikane to come and eat. You could see the faces of these ones. Some of them were university students. They just loved our home. So every Sunday there was a celebration. After service. Hallelujah. When you serve people, you receive that massive joy. And when you watch their faces, they're so happy. Those two girls, the other one, when you gave her a gift, she said, thank you. That's all. Straight face. Amen? But the other one will be so joyful. So when we give... The other girl who was so joyful, we all were very happy. The one, thank you. We said, okay. 
At least we've seen the joy in this one's face. Praise the Lord. Matthew 20, 28 says about attitudes. Let's read together. Go. Your attitude must be like my own, for I did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus is saying, hey, I didn't come here to be served. I want to serve. Brethren, there is something about serving others. There's some, something happens to you. Again, I don't want to give too many examples about me, but on Wednesdays, I'll listen to your own examples. I joined a meeting of people from my tribe when we were back home. And when it was time for food, everybody wanted food. But very poor did not want to serve others. Yours truly was serving. And every time we met, we met once a month. The president of the meeting said, As a can, meaning a can, that's how we say, a can, don't forget yourself because you serve every person else, but you will not eat. And I did that purposefully. Because I was a Christian, I wanted to show them Christian love. But this president or chairman will always remind me, don't forget to put your little share by the side. I did not listen. I made sure everybody had food. When they got to their Mayonde Mohona, oh, I, that was not my part. My part was to serve them the food. But brethren, it gave me so much joy. And I saw smiles on people's faces. Do you want to put a smile on somebody's face? Yes. Serve them. Jesus says, I came not to be served, but to? Yes, Romans 14, 18. Another verse. If you serve Christ in this way, with the attitude of Christ, you will please God and be respected by people. You want to draw respect from people? Be their servant. There's a little song which goes, If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. If you want to be great, oh, in God's kingdom, Learn to be the servant of all. Learn to be the servant of all. Learn to be the servant of all. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. My wife did a phenomenal job with all of our kids because she got those songs from the internet and taught my children. And they all know this song, all of them. They may be quiet in the audience, but they know the songs because they sang those songs. They went along with, the program was Sing Along. And you have this one, la 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 la. In God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Help me. We great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. May we live after this message with one purpose in mind. I'm bivocational and I will serve people. Just as my Jesus did. If there's something to do, do it. Amen? I've never forgotten what our pastor said on this pulpit a while ago when he said, when he goes to the bathroom, because it's are open bathrooms, people scatter things and when I go and jog, there are bathrooms. Some people leave them very messy. I remember the lesson he taught. I will take Whatever it needs, sprinkle water and then clean up the place and go wash my hands. 
I've done that ever since. I live a place better than I found it. A servant at heart. Nobody sees, but God sees you. Praise the name of Jesus. So we have seen how it, create, it creates massive joy in you. We see how it improves what? Our number three. And this is the biggie. Proverbs 11.25 says, the one who blesses others is what? Please, can you help me? Let's read together. Go. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped by who? By God. <laughs> See, brethren, this is so sweet. You want to be abundantly blessed? You have the formula given by God. If you bless others, God himself will abundantly bless you. Do we believe it? Okay. If we help others, we will be helped by him. Don't expect help from another person. Expect your help from 1 Peter 4.10 and we'll go through this 1 Peter 4.10 in depth on Wednesday. Talking about your ship. We'll review it. For others who didn't know it, we'll do it. Now, let's read 1 Peter 4.10 about serving others. How does it begin? Go. God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other, passing on to others God's many kinds of blessings. Oh my God. <sighs> Are you happy? I am. This brings us into what we have introduced before called SHIP. SHIP. SHIP stands for, the acronym for SHIP is S standing for spirit, right? H stands for your heart's passions or desires. A stands for your natural abilities. Amen? What's the next letter? P stands for your personality. And E stands for all of your life's experiences, whether they be in the family, in the school, at work, much more. But the good news is that your shape is unique. Did you get that? Yes. God made, has made us what we are. In Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works, which God planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. There are no two people who are alike. God never made a carbon copy of you. Even twins who are born twins. Amen? Some, somebody has twins here. Hallelujah. Are they the same? They are so different because they are uniquely made. May I remind you what I said some time ago? That these snowflakes, snowflakes, right? No two snowflakes are the same. So, no two people are the same. You are unique in every single way. You have a unique voice. On Wednesday, we'll try it out. Amen? We'll tell some, everybody to say, God. you hear everybody pronounce it very different. Amen? You have different eye colors. No two people have the same eye color. No two people have the same thumbprint. No two. You are very unique. What a God that has created us so uniquely. Raise your hand up and wave to the Lord and say, God, I'm very unique. There's no one like me. Hallelujah. That's why you don't imitate people. That's why you don't compare yourself with people. No. 
Because you're unique. And until people understand this, comparison to be, oh, he doesn't preach like uh, his son. He doesn't sing like, don't do that. Because you are unique in your genre. Hallelujah. Why did God do that? Because God is unique in his genre. Praise the name of Jesus. God doesn't clone people. <laughs> no one in history has been like you. No one in history is like you. No one in history will ever be like you. From beginning to eternity, you are you. Tell somebody, I'm thankful. Please look at somebody and tell I'm thankful that God made me unique. And I'll never compare myself with some other person. Hallelujah. Um, I did a mistake sometime with two of my sons. I told one, I said, why are you not like? And the son was mad. Dad, you never compare me with. I'll leave out the names. Hallelujah. And you know, I learned my lesson. I get even more understanding by seeing that God created me alone. No other person will be like me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, you are blessed with special abilities. Now, on Wednesday, I will show you when you leave out the S, because there are two S's. You have the spirit man in you, and you have the big S when Christ comes into your life. And it functions differently. You don't have any spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. If you are not born again. Today that you receive Christ. The Holy Spirit has come and is dwelling in you. So you are now complete. You are not hap. You are sheep. Do you get what I'm saying? Before you be had a sheep. You were hap. H-A-P-E. Because the sinful spirit in you is dead. But once you become a member of God's family, you have all of the spiritual gifts, special gifts, that we'll look at on Wednesday. Will you say amen with me? So, when I serve God and I serve others, I have massive amounts of joy. It improves my relationships. In fact, I am a total blessing. I'm a total blessing. It brings, the third thing, it brings meaning to my life. See, you do not know your meaning in this life until you can use the gifts that God has given you. Did you hear that? Yes. Listen, you do not know your significance. You don't know your importance in this world until you start exercising those things that God has given you to God and to others. That's point number three. It brings meaning to my life. Can we read the two verses together? Go. Mark 8.35. Go. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Amen? I give up my life. Give my life away. Remember? Yes. So you can use me. So God cannot use you until you give your life. Does this make sense to all of us? Are we excited about this? Give your life away. For God's sake and for the good news of spreading the good news. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, NCV, also admonishes us. Go. So, my dear brothers and sisters, stand how? Strong. Do not let anything move you. Now, listen to the clencher. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your work in the Lord is never wasted. The fifth lesson which we're going to get next Sunday talks about 
being a missionary. Hallelujah. What you do in serving others, you are being a minister. A minister means one who serves. We are all called to be ministers of God. But then there is another office. Some of us are called into one of the five offices. You are either called to the office of an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, or teacher. God has called to that special office. But know this, that every Christian is a minister. A minister means one who is called to serve. When God called us 24 years ago, the first brochure that I wrote was call to serve. Hallelujah. I understood my calling. It wasn't called to be a pastor. It was called to be a minister. One who serves. Praise the Lord. So it brings me great joy. Not only does it create massive amounts of joy in me, not only does it improve my relationships, number three, it brings meaning to my life. You have meaning in your life when you serve others. Praise the Lord. There's a friend of mine who has gone to be with the Lord. He was 80-something years old. He's left a widow who is weak. The widow has children, big children, who work. But that lady chose to tell me and my wife that every time her water is finished, guess who should bring water? Us. And we do with such joy. Whenever she calls, Brother Willie, yes, ma'am. I'm out of water. And she only drinks spring water. So we have to go to the store, get the spring water, and bring it. I wish you could, I'm serious. I wish you could call me every week. It's truly a delight. When I come with, a, with the water and I, I come, sometimes I carry it with my, and I, I develop what? My muscles, right? So they don't get weak. I carry them. Oh, welcome. Sometimes my wife has time to come with me and we both carry it to her. When we say, you know what happens on her face? You're not a prophet? Smile. <laughs> I are here with my water. Brethren, you know the significance in your life when you serve people. I wish this was Wednesday that you too will give your own testimony. I know many of you do the same service. But let God really hammer this that I'm bivocational. I serve God and I serve others. Will you say amen with me? <coughs> the last, the fourth one. Amen? And so, the last one. Hallelujah. You will leave a lasting legacy. Somebody told me in this church, said, Daddy, we need to have our own place. Why? Because our children and children's children will know their daddy and mommies left this place for them. Hallelujah. You, if you do things only for you, it's short-sighted. But when you do things to last beyond you, you've done great. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, Learn to live a legacy. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, we live a lasting legacy when we serve God and serve others. Here I had to get more verses than you would like. Hallelujah. Let's read the verses together. Proverbs 10, 7. Go. Good people will be remembered as a blessing. Do you want when you pass through this life, you've gone up to heaven, that you are remembered as a blessing? Right. Is that what you really desire? Yes. 
Can we continue? Hebrews 6.10, NCV says, God is fair. He will not forget the work you did and the love you showed for him by helping his people. You are a minister helping his people. And he will remember you and remember that you are still helping them. Amen? What you've done and you're still alive, you are still doing what? Helping them. Matthew 20, 26 says, if you want to be great, you must be a servant of all. That's where that song came from. Can we sing it one more time? If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. You want to be great in God's kingdom, Learn to be the servant of all. How do we apply this message? We have two verses, but I want to say this to you. No task that you do from a pure heart to others is menial. Amen? Again, let me give you another example. You, have, you two are like me. You do many of those things. But when we came back to this country, I didn't have a job readily. You know what I did? I went to the mall and I asked if there was a job. See, yes, there's a job here. I was a professor with a, you know, you know what I was. I put that professoralship, how? Threw it away. I went and I was cleaning the mall. My daughter, one of them here, the friend said, ah, we saw your dad sweeping the mall. He said, yes. What was the idea? My family would not starve as long as I have strength. While waiting for that big job to be hired back in the university, I have my hands and I can sweep and I can mop. And what I'm doing, I, I sing. Hallelujah. Maybe because I sing, people notice, ah, that guy is mopping and... <laughs> You know, he's enjoying what he's doing. And I truly enjoyed it because it put bread on the table for my family. We are called to serve. Let's read. Now, so no menial task is meaningless when done with the right attitude. Can you write that down? No menial task is meaningless. In fact, it is meaningful when done with the right attitude or motive. No minor task becomes meaningless. Instead, it becomes meaningful when done with the right motive. Let's read the two verses as we close. Amen? John 12, 26 from the NCV says, please help me now read. Go. If you serve me, who is that me? God. By vocational, you serve God. You must go with me. My servants will be with me wherever I. If you serve me, my father will honor. How come I am blessed and highly favored when I honor God? Hallelujah! Number two, Colossians 3, 7. And this now for others. Let's read it with joy. I beg, the last joy you have in you. Go. Whatever you say or do should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus as you give thanks to God, the Father, because of him. Will you say amen? Rise with me and let's say this prayer and then I'll give the stage over to our pastor to close us up. Stretch your hands to this prayer and pray it for yourself. I'll pray it for myself. Amen? Amen. Go. From 1 Kings 8.54. Go. May God keep... Oh, good pastor. Not now. Pray for yourself. Go put your name there. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's start now. Go. May God keep William centered and devoted to him following the, his life path he has cleared Watching the signpost 
walking at the pace and rhythm he has laid down.